So many, 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 many years ago, I was at Trout Creek Bible Camp, and I was there, and I had been to church, and my family went to church, didn't really understand what it was all about. And then in eighth grade, there was a, a pastor, his name was Mark DeMoz, and, uh, and he was speaking, and, and he described what Jesus did on the cross. And then how Jesus died in my place. And then the band started playing that song, We Exalt Thee. And he gave an altar call. He said, if you want to give your life to Jesus and receive his gift of salvation, come forward. It was to that song that the band was playing that I went forward and gave my life to Jesus. And, And what happened when I did that is... We talk about rains a lot around here. These are like horse rains. And when you're the rider on the back of a horse, you're controlling the horse. If you do this, the horse goes that way, do this, it goes, you're able to direct where the horse goes. Well, what I did to that song, We Exalt Thee, is I went forward and I said, Jesus, you take my reins. I give my reins to you. And we introduced this concept of saddle breaking a horse. We introduced it back in Genesis three three years ago, almost four years ago, going through Genesis. We're looking at Jacob's life. And we compared Jacob's life to breaking a horse. And I showed this video I'm going to show you here in a second. This is of the Outback Ranger. And what he's doing is he's taking a wild, unbroken horse and he's saddle breaking it. And I want you to watch how he does that with this horse. So it's not until that horse is saddle broken that that horse can truly experience a relationship with the rider. But do horses like what it takes to be broken? Do they enjoy that process? I don't know if you noticed this, but did you notice that he tied up one of his legs? He took away what he's used to depend on. He's used to being able to walk, and that leg is always there. But that leg is gone, takes away what the horse likes or wants to feel comfortable with so that the horse can learn to trust the rider, that even when that leg's not there, the rider is still there to protect it. Until they fully trust the rider on their back. In the notes there, the first blank in the bulletin or on the app. The app is great because it kind of fills it in as you go. But a horse is considered saddle broken when they are obedient to the one who holds the reins. Because the entire life of that horse, it's holding its own reins. It's just going where it wants to go. But it can't experience a relationship with the rider until that horse says, okay, you call the shots. And it's only then that that horse experiences love. Well, who's supposed to hold the reins in our lives? It's the Lord. You know, where the Lord is our king, where the Lord... We, we surrender our will over to him and say, you call the shots. In our relationship with the Lord, we are like a horse and Jesus holds the rein. And just like a cowboy breaks a horse's will, not its spirit, but its will, Jesus is saddle breaking us. And just like a horse, we don't like the process. Specifically, we don't like the process because it makes us uncomfortable. We don't like the process because often what happens isn't what we want to have happen. We have to go through hard times. We have to go through difficulties. But probably more significant is a key tool that he uses is making us wait. I've shared that I had the privilege with my daughter McKenna and my father-in-law of kind of being on the outside watching a cowboy break a horse for McKenna and my father-in-law. 
And this is a professional cowboy, and we'd go sit there on the hay bales as he was, as, was breaking Pilate the horse. And it was fascinating to watch because he'd do stuff like that, use the ropes to take away things, or he would use something to kind of scare the horse to make sure it knew it was okay still. But a lot of times, it was like the horse whisperer. It's like Robert Redford just kind of like staring there just for hours, quiet. And at the right moment, the cowboy knew to pick up the rope or to use the ring. He knew the right moment, but the horse had to wait. And that is what we're going to talk about this morning. It's because some of us, we have been waiting a long time. Now, I'm not talking about little things that we're waiting for. I'm talking about those deep heart cries that we've been praying for decades over. In fact, the whole chapter, chapter 18 of the book of Luke, Jesus is going to address that. About why does the Lord make us wait? Well, those unyielding circumstances we endlessly pray about, but God never seems to answer, are often the very tool God is using to break us. And here's the key to all this that we'll discover as we continue through the book of Luke, is that God's priority isn't our happiness, it's owning our heart. And when I say our heart, our heart is what we desire most. It's our will. He wants to own it. He wants us, you know, we're holding the reins to our lives and calling our own shots he wants to hold the reins in every area of our life because it's then, only then, when we allow him to call the shots that we experience the love and relationship with the Lord. Just like a rider on the back of a horse. Lord, as we turn to this passage this morning, you've been working all morning. God, I pray you continue to, to move and to work we respond to your spirit this morning. As Abby prayed earlier, Lord, that as I speak, I would be a conduit, a pipe of your power, authority, and love. And that doesn't happen through an eloquent speech or superior wisdom, but only through a demonstration of your spirit's power so that our faith doesn't rest upon man, but instead upon God's power. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, where we left off last week, verse 1, chapter 18. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. We've talked about all the way through this section of Luke, every time, who's he talking to? Who's he talking to here? Everybody's disciples. Everybody's saying it real quiet. It's the disciples. And in this part of Luke, it's either going to be the crowd Crowds, excuse me, the Pharisees or the disciples. Well, he's talking to the disciples here, and he already told them what he's gonna, what the lesson of this parable is gonna be is that don't give up, keep praying. Specifically, those things that you've been praying for for years, praying that you'd find a husband, somebody that would love you, or a wife, praying that your mom or your dad might find Jesus as their savior. Praying that you would discover what, what God's purpose is for your life. That your kids would finally stop down the worldly path and discover Jesus as their Savior. Those things you've been praying about for decades and you keep praying. The whole point of this is keep on praying, don't give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. Do you notice that this is the exact opposite of the great commandment? Remember, they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? So he said, well, first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So love God and love people. That's it. You know, around here we talk about we are for God, therefore we are for people. Well, this judge, this judge is like, he doesn't love God and he doesn't love people. <laughs> He's the opposite. And that's on purpose here as he's, as he's sharing this parable. As he's sharing this parable, 
This is a parable of contrast. Jesus did not share this parable to say that God was like the unjust judge, but in nature and character completely opposite from him. So he's going to talk about this unjust judge and what he does and contrast that to how much more does a loving God act versus an unjust judge. So let's find out what happens. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. We talk about it all the time around here. We li- I, I like to say it this way. If you want to get close to God, you get close to the things that break God's heart. One of the reasons I got involved you know, 15 years ago with HIV and AIDS ministry in Africa was because I knew that God's heart was for people in Africa who were suffering with AIDS and HIV. I want to get close to God. I'm going to get close to the things that break God's heart. Well, you know what else breaks God's heart? Widows. Now, I want to make sure if there is a widow among us, I want to make sure we do everything to protect that widow, care for her. Because we know even from James how important widows are or orphans. We need to do everything we can to protect them. Be their advocate when no one else will advocate for them. So with that said, this judge neither loved God nor loved his neighbor. You know, he, he could care less about this widow. Well, had this judge been a seeker of God, then he would have made providing justice for this widow a top priority. But he didn't. Because he didn't care about God and he didn't care about people. He just probably just cared about himself. And so she kept coming back. There was an injustice done to this widow. And as a judge, he should have been protecting her, but he wasn't. But she kept coming back week after week, pleading her case. He's like, get away, get away, whatever. But she keeps coming back. Now she's an annoyance. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself... Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Literally, this judge is going to provide justice to this widow because she's annoying. If anyone's ever worked with kids, if you're a teacher in a school, This is that annoying kid who keeps bothering you about something. And just to get him to shut up, you finally deal with it. (laughs) It's because she's annoying that he's finally going to deal with it. It reminds me of of chapter 11 when we were in Luke 11 a few months ago. And we talked about shameless audacity, how Jesus tells us to pray with shameless audacity, like a neighbor knocking on the door at midnight. And you keep knocking until they finally answer. That's how we're to pray, shameless audacity. Same type of idea here with shameless audacity, but here a little bit different. Here, the widows, it's supposed to have a widows there. Sorry, it's a spelling mistake. The widows' shameless audacity overcomes the judge's selfish reluctance. But this parable is meant to contrast how much more we can rest in the loving justice of God. If this unjust judge will provide justice just because he's annoyed by this woman, well, how much more will God respond when we cry out to him and we are his precious children that he created? And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? who cry out to him day and night, will he keep putting them off? The answer? Yeah. (laughs) He will. Until the right time. It's like that cowboy that we were watching break Pilate the horse. He just sat there making that horse wait until the perfect time when he reached down and grabbed the reins, actually grabbed the halter at one point to put it on the horse at the right time. That's exactly how the Lord works. You know, I'd say it this way. So often we feel like we have to be like 
a widow who goes before God and just prays and use our shameless audacity almost to overcome God's reluctance. No, God is not reluctant to move in our lives. Did you know that? I, I am coming before God because, you know, I'm praying that my son, he would stop this life that's just leading to destruction. I've been praying for years and years. God, why don't you answer? Why don't you respond? And we keep going. It's almost like we have to overcome God's reluctance. What we have to understand, God is not reluctant. His greatest joy is to move and respond to the cries of our heart. Jesus wasn't saying we should always pray and not give up because God is reluctant, but rather the opposite. He loves to respond to the heart cries of his chosen ones by delivering absolute justice, but only at the perfect time. Sometimes he makes us wait. For months, years, decades. But we have to remember he loves us. He's not reluctant. He's waiting for the right time. And this is a hard truth because we are so temporal. We think of the, remember the rope where we have the little red part and then we have the, the you know, Dan had his little 75 foot rope. I had my 300 foot rope that represented eternity. It keeps going round and round the earth. Well, we're so focused on this little red part. God is focused on the, the eternity. He may not answer our cry of our heart until we die. We may never see our kids come to Christ in our lifetime, but we may have a front row view of it from heaven. But we can trust. He's not reluctant. He's more than willing. It's his greatest joy, but he's going to wait until it's the right time to put the har harness on the horse. I'll say it this way. And you know what? Quite honestly, if you've fallen asleep, wake up right now and then you can go back to sleep. Here it is. <laughs> Jesus loves us too much to answer our prayers or deliver justice at the imperfect time. He loves us too much to give us the cries of our heart at the imperfect time. Because he will deliver at the perfect time and the perfect moment. The unjust situations we face, he will deliver justice. Yeah, but you don't know how he treated me for years. He will deliver justice at the perfect time. But the reality is, God's priority isn't our happiness. We may be unhappy because we're not experiencing, you know, well, this is so wrong. It's just all this. We just have to trust he will deliver at the perfect time. Because his priority isn't our happiness. It's owning our heart. That's saying, okay, owning my heart. God, you take the reins. I don't care what happens because I trust you. And that's when we discover that loving relationship with the Lord because he's in charge, not us. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man, remember we've talked about it almost every week lately, is Son of Man is a messianic title, a title for the Messiah from the book of, of Daniel written hundreds of years earlier. And it was the title, the messianic title that Jesus loved to refer to himself as, as the Son of Man. I am the Messiah. However, when the Messiah, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Time out. Don't forget who Luke is writing this book to. It's Theophilus, his friend. His friend from Syria. And his friend accepted Jesus as his Savior, but now he's starting to have doubts Likely, because if you look at when the book of Luke was written, it's when persecution started happening in the church. Leading up to the epitome of it was in the time of Nero, when Nero, the, the, the emperor of Rome, was lighting Christians on fire to light his garden parties. So Luke's here, in, or excuse me, Theophilus is here in Syria as a follower of Jesus going, 
I didn't sign up for this. Well, if you look at that, Jesus was prophetically speaking to believers like Theophilus who would be facing persecution that they can pray knowing they will receive justice if not in this life, then when Jesus returns. Remember, Luke is writing this to Theophilus and he, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was collecting these stories and writing eyewitness accounts of what Jesus said. And he made sure that it was written here, don't give up, keep on praying. And here's this unjust judge who still delivered justice even though he was unjust and ungodly. How much more will the God of creation who loves you and created you give you justice when you're facing persecution? And that justice doesn't always happen in this life. But we know it will happen even if it has to wait until the Messiah comes back. That is a sweet promise for every single person who sits in a prison cell today. There's more martyrs in prison and suffering for Jesus today than in the history of the world. And it's unjust. Christians crucified in the Middle East right now. It is unjust. It is wrong. It makes my blood boil. There's pastors locked away in China suffering. Unjust. It's wrong. Justice will come at the perfect time. That's what Jesus is saying right here. We have to remember God's priority isn't our happiness. It's not our safety. It's not our comfort. His priority is owning our hearts. Verse 9. <clears throat> Excuse me. To some who were confident in uh, who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. So he was talking to the disciples. Now who is he talking to? The Pharisees. And probably some in the crowd. <laughs> So if we talk about it, he's not naming them by Pharisees, but he's saying, well, these are people confident in their own righteousness and look down on everyone else. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's probably talking to the wealthy elite in the crowd. And he's telling them this story. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Okay, so we've learned as we've gone through Luke how much the Jews loved tax collectors, right? No. Anybody in here love the IRS? Especially now that it's like February, March. <laughs> no, we don't like the IRS. Nobody wants to get a phone call or a letter from the IRS. Same thing here, only way worse. Because remember, we learned last week they were an occupied nation. Judah, the people of Israel, they were occupied by the Romans. This would be equivalent to if China invaded the United States and took over, and suddenly our streets were filled with Chinese tanks and soldiers. We would hate the occupying army in our streets. They hated the Romans. Well, their IRS, the Romans, they would hire Jewish citizens to be the tax collectors. So the tax collectors were traitors to their people. They despised them. They hated them as traitors to their nation. So that's one of these guys. The other guy was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the brightest and best that their country had to offer. The, these were, you know, we, we know that they were wealthy, but it was more than that. They were the, they were the model of following after God. And they were like, the best and the brightest of the country. The same way we look at like maybe somebody who goes to the Air Force Academy or goes to Stanford or something like that, only it was bigger because they, they loved God and they would go after God. Well, that's who I want to be like. That's what they would have in their mind as they listen to this story. So you have the worst of their culture and the best of their culture. The worst was the tax collector. The best was the Pharisee. But I want you to notice as this Pharisee prays, this is the best of their country, how many eyes he has in his prayer. <laughs> you 
You know, and when we, uh, people talk about themselves, it's because it's all they think about. Me, 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 my, 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 I, 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 I. That's hard to say. Okay. Verse 11. Circle it in your Bible every time he says I. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. In the Greek, it emphasizes he's by himself. As if to say, he's praying, but God's not there. He's by himself. (laughs) Because he's not praying to God. He's praying to himself. God, I, circle it. (laughs) I thank you that I am not like the other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this traitor, this tax collector. I fast twice a week and and give a tenth of all I get. Okay, this Pharisee, he came to the temple to pray. It'd be like coming to a church to pray, but it had nothing to do with God. Love this quote from C. Marvin Pate says this, it is entirely possible to address your words to God, but actually be praying to yourself because your focus is on yourself, not on God. Your passion is for your agenda, not God's. Your attitude is my will be done and not thy will be done. The man was full of praise, but he rejoiced not for who God was, but rather for who he was. All of us are guilty of this. Did you know that? Every single one of us. I have taught from this stage like that. Where it's, God has nothing to do with it. It's just Brian, his ego, what he wants to say. It's like, okay, you know, when I was in eighth grade, I I gave the Lord the reins to my life. But so often I'm like, "Mm, I'm taking it back. And God's like, okay, go ahead. And it's not that I'll lose salvation or anything like that. It's just a a walk away from the Lord and toward, you know, self-destruction and selfishness. It's a bone-chilling thought to realize how many people think they are coming to church to worship, but it's nothing more than an emotionally charged, self-centered ego trip. Can anybody relate to this? Because I sure can. Or going to church for the... Connections, it's a good social club. Here's the question. Who owned this Pharisee's heart? Me, self. You know, God certainly didn't hold his reins. He held his reins, and it's all about him. Self-justification It's me, 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 my, 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 I, I, I. He didn't understand that God's priority wasn't his happiness or that he wasn't like the traitor. God's priority was owning his heart. But the tax collector stood at a distance. Remember where we're at. They're at the temple of Herod, Herod's temple, first century. And and they're there. You know, we've studied so much about the tabernacle and Leviticus and numbers online. And and the tabernacle was set up as just like the temple would eventually be modeled off the tabernacle. It represents the very throne room of God. And if we look back there, that building represented the tent with the holy place and the most holy place, the holy of holies, where the the Ark of the Covenant was, which represented the throne of God. So what happened is that the Pharisee, he went and he couldn't go inside the building because only the priest could go there. But he probably went right up on the steps, right in front of the door, right there, you know, and he's praying right there. And even though everybody would look around and say, oh, wow, look how close he is to, to the Lord God wasn't there. But then you have the the tax collector, the traitor to the country. He stood at a distance. We don't know. Maybe off in the corner or back against the wall. He he he's back as far away as he can because, you know, probably because he gets spit on by somebody or somebody would say something nasty to him. 
But he's back. He stood at a distance away from the crowd. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. The verb tense there for beat his breast, it's, it's like he continued to do it. It's like literally he continued to just beat his breast. You know, he's just like, God, have mercy on me. The humility of this tax collector was palpable. He was so aware of his sin and the corruption of his heart that he beat or hit his own heart as a reckoning. And all he could do was cry out for mercy. Question, who owned the tax collector's heart? Really? Well, hold on, hold on. I don't know if the Lord owned his heart at this point. I'd say it this way. God allowed this man, this traitor, this tax collector to go down a self-centered dark road of greed and treason towards his own people. This financially rewarding path only led to shame, regret, and desperation in which he lost everything except his money. Do you see that? But only God can salvage our dark paths. Only God. I hope if you're here this morning and you know you've been making the wrong decisions, whether it's drugs, relationships, finances, and you're sitting here, maybe you've made bad decisions when it comes to your physical relationship with your boyfriend and your girlfriend. You, you, you know that it's not supposed to be that way or you've been going down this path and you just feel shame. Listen, this tax collector was at that place. Maybe you've lost everything. That's where this tax collector is. And what he's doing is going, he's just, all he can do is beat his breast. He's like, I've lost everything, God. Please have mercy on me. And when we cry out to God and we say, God, just have mercy on me. Look at where the rains are. They're here. I think one of the reasons the Lord tells us to raise our hands, lift our hands in praise, it's this. It's holding out the reins of our lives to say, God, have mercy on me. And it's then that the Lord comes and takes the reins of our lives. And he's in control. He starts calling shots. Only God can salvage our selfish, evil choices into the very tool he uses to break us and lead us to surrendering to him. God allows us to go down those dark paths because his priority, he knows it's not going to make us happy, maybe temporarily, but he allows us to go down those dark paths because his priority isn't our happiness, it's owning our heart. I tell you that this man, this traitor, rather than the other, the Pharisee, the best the nation has to offer, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Question, who owns this tax collector's heart now? It's the Lord. The Lord owned his heart only for one reason. Instead of trying to defend or self-justify his bad choices, he allowed God to use the consequences of those poor decisions as a tool to build humility and brokenness. You know, you're not going to believe this, but there's a lot of imperfect lives and relationships in this church. <laughs> And as a pastor, I, I, it's such a privilege to walk through hard paths with so many people around here. It's hard. It's exhausting. And I, I try like marriages falling apart or family relationships that are broken. It's hard. But it's pretty easy to tell what, where it's going to go. You know what it is? 
is if one of the people is just full of excuses, I know there's not much hope that the relationship can be spared. Because excuses, just, it's just a way to find where blame everybody but yourself. Man, you want to heal relationships? Stop making excuses and own it. Own your piece of the pie. Because just like this man, he didn't try to make excuses. He's just like, I'm just crying out for mercy. I know I've messed up. God's priority isn't our happiness or us feeling like we're justified or well, we didn't do the wrong. It was her fault or it was his fault. No, he just wants to own our heart. Verse 15, people were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. You know, it was a tradition. I mean, even to this day, You know, the hem streets are here with their brand new little one. And the tradition would be to take this precious little boy, take him to a, a respected rabbi at the temple, and the rabbi would, would lay their hands on them and a blessing over this child. That was the tradition. Still to this day, at the Western Wall in Israel, that's the tradition. Well, they were bringing their infants, their babies, to Jesus because he was a respected rabbi to to bless this child. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Say, hey, get those babies away from Jesus. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never be able to enter it. Now, First glance, this story seems a little bit out of place here. Kind of almost seems random. We're talking chapter 17, we're talking about the kingdom of God and afterlife and heaven and hell and kingdom and all this. And then we're talking about prayer and, and we're talking about you know repentance before the Lord. Then all of a sudden, Jesus blesses the little children. It's like, well, what is this about? Well, as Luke included this story, it was intentional. To say, okay, you want to talk about coming to the Lord? If you want to come to the Lord, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, it's not this of providing your own way. It's this. You have to come like a little child, like an infant. Because here's the humility of a little child. An infant is the word that Luke uses. A child comes with no pretension. Babies received the blessing of Jesus without trying to make themselves worthy of it or pretending that they don't need it. Do you see that? Do you see how it fits? Babies don't come and say, hey, I want the blessing of Jesus. I'm going to go get it, right? All they do is just kind of sit there sucking their thumb, all right? That was a weird sound. Yeah, and their parents bring them, Jesus, would you just bless this child? And they receive that blessing from Jesus without earning it. Just sitting there, sucking their thumb and pooping their diapers, right? Well, that's the humility that we need to have in coming to Jesus. Verse 18, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, I like, you know, one of the things, I like to take notes in my Bible, and I encourage you to mark up your Bibles. And, and one of the things, I like to draw arrows in my Bible, in my personal Bible. And this is an area where I would draw an arrow. I would draw an arrow from here in chapter 18, or chapter 18, verse 19. I, I'd draw an arrow from that right back to chapter 17. Because in 16 and 17, it's talking about heaven and hell, what happens when we die. It's a huge glimpse. It's one of the biggest glimpses we have into what actually happens the moment we die. What happens in the afterlife. So here's a man who comes here, this ruler. We find out from Matthew that he's rich or that he's young. We find out later that he's rich. He's this rich young ruler is what he's called in the Bible. And he comes, he's like, hey, Jesus, hey, how do I inherit eternal life? Because he'd been listening. 
He had been listening to what Jesus had been teaching. And he's like, this is like somebody who goes up after a lecture and asks the professor, hey, can I have a few more questions? That's what this is. Well, Jesus responded to him. Why do you call me good? Remember, he said, good teacher. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Well, apparently the man thought Jesus had gained a measure of status with God by his good works. Jesus was implying that if he were truly good, then it would be because he is God. So Jesus isn't saying, well, why are you calling me good? I'm not good. No, 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 no. What Jesus is saying, well, do you realize what you're saying? Charles Spurgeon said it this way. The argument is clear. Either Jesus was good or he ought not to have called him good. But as there is none good but God, Jesus who is good must be God. Verse 20. You know the commandments. And, and what Jesus is going to do here is he's going to list off a few of the Ten Commandments. So he says, you know the commandments, the Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. <clears throat> you shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. Do you hear the same attitude that was in the Pharisees? Here's this rich young ruler, and he says, hey, I got it, man. Check, 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 check. I've done all those things. All those things I have kept since I was a youth. It's the same attitude of self-righteousness, of self-dependence as the Pharisees had. Well, the Jewish elite in the first century built their lives around a legalistic pursuit of keeping the law through works in order to earn God's favor. They honestly believed that they kept all Ten Commandments. Why do you think they hated Jesus so much? Because when Jesus taught, he exposed how they hadn't kept anything. Because they may have physically, they never murdered somebody, but they burned an anger towards somebody in their hearts. Jesus took it from a, a behavior to an attitude of the heart. Yeah, they may have never committed adultery, but man, they've lusted after women. And Jesus exposed, you guys haven't kept anything. It's a heart issue. Behavior is just an extension of what's happening in your heart. Well, God's priority with the Pharisees even, it wasn't their happiness. It's owning their heart. Jesus wanted to own their heart too. When Jesus heard this, I've kept all this since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he went, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Question, who owned this ruler's heart? It was money. It was money. You know, he outwardly, he kept the Ten Commandments since he was a boy in order to earn God's favor. But God didn't own his heart. Money owned his heart. And it's interesting. Mark, the synoptic gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they generally tell the same stories from a different perspective. Well, Mark, which is actually likely Peter's recollections of Jesus, Mark records an observation that Peter made about this situation. Same story. Look, look what Peter noticed. In Mark chapter 10, Teacher, that's the, the rich young ruler. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Do you hear that? This would be very encouraging for anyone in this room who's walked down a bad path. I'd say it this way. Despite money owning the man's heart, Jesus still kept the young ruler in his heart. Do you see that? It comes back to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, breaking us. It's why God does this. 
Because one thing he still lacked, God owning his heart. And God will put his finger on whatever is in our life that's keeping us from following Jesus. For this young ruler, his idol, what he was looking to, he was depending upon, that was in his heart, that owned his heart, was money. That's what dedicated, determined all of his decisions was money. For all of, all of us have something different. It could be, you know, power relationships. It could be sports. It could be sex. Whatever it is, God is going to take it away, just like he took away the, the leg of the horse. When we come, when we come seeking God, seeking answers in eternal life, that eternal life is only found in Jesus. So whatever it is that's keeping us for following Jesus, that's exactly what God will put his finger on. Because God's priority isn't our happiness. It's not that we achieve our athletic dreams. That's not his goal. It's not that we have more money than we know how to spend. That's not his goal. It's not that we finally find a guy who loves us. That's not his goal. His goal is owning our heart. Jesus looked at him as he's walking away. He just re rejected Jesus because of money. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And if you've gone to church more than a couple years, I know you've heard a teacher say, you know, kind of spiritualize this to say, oh, well, well what it was actually saying is there was a, a needle gate and you'd have to get the camels and camels would have to go down and kind of squeeze through. It's not what Jesus was saying here at all. That would be like saying, well, you know what? It's just really hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom. Like, you know, they just have to really try hard. Bull honky. <laughs> no. Jesus wasn't saying it's just difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom. He was saying it's impossible. Do you hear that, Americans? That if you have a car, you're in the top 8% for wealth in the world. If you have two cars, you're in the top 2% for wealth in the world. If you had breakfast in this, mor this morning, you're in the top 10% for wealth in the world. Guess what? You're rich. Maybe not in America, but compared to the rest of the, the history of mankind, you're the wealthiest people who have ever lived. It's impossible, impossible for you to enter the kingdom. Why? Because money will always find a way to own the hearts of the rich. And that's how they, the, the crowd understood this. They got what Jesus was saying, that it's impossible. Those who heard this asked him, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Praise the Lord for that verse. Otherwise, Americans would have no hope. I would have no hope. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Connecting back to that original question that the rich man brought, seeking eternal life. Well, the young ruler fell for the deception, the same one most people in America fall for, that if your good deeds, out, deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you can somehow earn God's favor and eternal life. That's the biggest lie, deception that the enemy has in his arsenal. Is that, well, if I'm just good enough, it's like our lives are on a scale. If I'm just good enough, if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I'll get to go to heaven. Well, I've made too many mistakes God can't save me. You know, it's, it's all about if you're good or bad. You know what? It's impossible. You can't hold the reins of your life. You can't. You can't earn your way. You can't be good enough. You'll always fall short. Jesus makes it clear that with man, it's impossible. We can't be good enough. But what is impossible with, God, with man is possible with God. That's the cross. Because when we sin, the consequence of that sin is death. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. The and if we sin, we earn death. But Jesus died 
in my place so I don't have to die. But I can accept that gift. And how I accept that gift of him dying in my place, it's impossible for me, but it's all things are possible in God. How I accept that gift is I say, Jesus, I need your mercy. I make you the boss of my life. You take the reins of my life. You call the shots. You're my Lord. That's how to enter the kingdom of God. I'm going to have the band come up here. But as they come up, can you understand why God allows us to suffer, allows us to go down dark, selfish paths? Can you understand why his priority isn't necessarily our happiness? He doesn't care about our happiness. What he cares about is owning our heart. And my challenge to you this morning is this. Just give your heart to the Lord. Let's all just bow our heads. I want to give you that opportunity. Just like when I was in eighth grade and I gave the reins of my life to the Lord, I want to give you the chance to do it right now. If you want to do that right now, I want to challenge you, whether you're at home watching online, if you're listening on the radio, if you're here in this room, all I want you to do is just cry out to him for mercy. And just do that by repeating after me. Just say this as a prayer. Just tell him, say, Jesus, I have sinned. I've gone down dark paths. I've earned death. But Jesus, I believe you died in my place and conquered death by raising from the dead. And right now, I give you the reins of my life. You take charge. Not my will, but your will. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, this is what I want you to do. I just want you to look up at me. Good. Awesome. I saw several people looking at me. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to rest in the fact that every mistake, every sin, everything that's isolated you, every shame you've ever had, it is covered by Jesus. Now, you are forgiven. And with that in mind, I want us all to stand and worship the one who forgives us. Thank you.